Hello and welcome to Correspondence, a show where we bring you the best France 24 reports from around the world. We're here in La Cité Florale in the 13th arrondissement of Paris. The streets here have been preserved since the 1920s. Due to the nature of the soil in this former floodland, only small buildings could be built. It's a calm oasis in the hustle and bustle of the capital. This week, we're bringing you to Tunisia, South Africa, and Lebanon. But first, let's head to Thailand. Like many of its neighboring countries, it's experiencing a new wave of coronavirus, the worst since the epidemic began about a year and a half ago. The government has put in place a new lockdown, much to the dismay of locals who blame the government for lagging behind in its vaccination campaign. Only 2% of the population is fully vaccinated, as our correspondent Constantin Simon reports. While countries around the world are lifting their lockdowns, Thailand is struggling to overcome a resurgent wave of COVID infections. This Bangkok market, usually bustling with activity, has been closed for the last two weeks. The shop owners haven't received any financial assistance from the government. With only 2% of the Thai population fully vaccinated, the government is facing growing criticism for its pandemic management. While targeted testing has increased and isolation centers have been created, the virus is now rampant in workers' camps like these, where many immigrants live. This camp is now a virtual prison, with more than 1,500 workers sealed inside. The situation is even worse in actual Thai prisons, which are notoriously overcrowded. More than 30,000 prisoners have tested positive in just the last month. This man was released after he got infected while in prison. แต่ตอนแรกก็ไอครับผมก็นั่งอยู่ใกล้ผมเขาก็เป็นเป็นนักโทษแล้วเนาะใกล้ๆกันแต่เขาจะเริ่มไอเขาก็ส่งไปที่
Mais en même temps, ceux qui respectent les morts respectent les vivants. Ça, pour moi, c'est fondamental. According to him, the Zarzis municipality needed help because existing cemeteries were already overcrowded. According to the UN, 557 people have died this year alone trying to cross the Mediterranean from Africa to Europe in rickety boats that don't always make it. Let's head now to Burkina Faso. In Dori, in the north of the country, a demonstration drew several thousand people denouncing the government's inaction in the face of deadly terrorist attacks over the past couple months and insecurity in general. According to the UN Refugee Agency, one million people have fled the violence, seeking refuge in other parts of the country. Kalidoussi brought us these accounts. Notre région est en prise donc de l'insécurité et du terrorisme depuis 2015. Mais nous sentons un laxisme donc dans, le, dans les agissements en tout cas des premiers gouvernements. In South Africa, an unprecedented trial took place this spring at the Pretoria High Court. Environmental activists sued the government over coal pollution. They say South Africa's failure to tackle toxic levels of air pollution is a violation of the post-apartheid constitution and causes thousands of deaths every year. Our correspondent Caroline Dumais has the story. Emala Hleni, a town whose name translates as the place of coal, is surrounded by mines and power stations like these. Bali lives here with her two young children. They have both developed asthma. We are breathing deadly air each and every day. So, and this make, make us sick and make our children sick. Emal Ahleni sits in an area of northern South Africa known as the High Felt. A 2019 government report found that illegal levels of air pollution here were responsible for close to 10,000 premature deaths annually. Two environmental organizations have taken the government to court, arguing that their constitutional right to a clean environment has been violated. They are demanding tighter regulations. This uh, air pollution is happening here in the community not to the owners of the mines, but it affects the community. That is why, as we are standing for the community, we have to do this. The government is opposing the legal challenge. The environment minister telling us that responsibility lies with the municipal authorities. Obviously, licensing of, of uh, power stations or any other institution that, that emits emissions um, is a, is a revenue generation activity. But we're saying to them, you can't just be generating revenue and not doing anything about the air qualities. It could be months before the court in Pretoria gives judgment on the high felt's deadly air problem. Finally, let's head to Lebanon. The country is still reeling from last summer's double explosion in the port of Beirut and an unprecedented economic crisis. All this in the context of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. But once again, the Lebanese are showing their resilience as little by little, nightlife returns to the capital. Our correspondent Sally Farhat went to find out more. The explosion last August left Jawa's neighborhood in ruins. Uh, he feels relieved that he's once again able to visit his favorite restaurants and pubs in Mamehael. Ma Mihail started seeing an influx of visitors in mid-May after the government eased COVID-19 restrictions. Eli Krady manages one of the pubs here. He believes people's commitment to revive Beirut is behind the rebirth of its nightlife. We had a long time that there was no one who was going to go to the 
بس شفنا عالم كثير عم تجي ومبسوطه ببيروت وهي بدها تدعم بيروت ورجعت تعيش بيروت فطلعنا من الدبريشن اللي نحن فيها مشاكل بعدها موجوده مستصعبينه انه نبقى هون ببيروت بس هذا تشالنج لنا ورح نبقى This bustling street mirrors the resilience of the Lebanese people and offers a glimmer of hope for the country still shaken by the Beirut blast. However, there are lingering uncertainties as Lebanon remains in the grips of its worst economic crisis ever. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of Correspondence. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to our team, Georges Yazbek, Natasha Milray, Marion Lory and Julien Sauvage for coordinating it. We're going to leave you with some very important images from one of the most popular competitions in the United States. It's not the Super Bowl, it's the annual Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. And this year, it's a Pekingese named Wasabi who won Best in Show and was a very good dog. <laughs>